Hey everybody, last minute adjusting going on here. Um, I definitely need uh, a sound check this week because I'm running a new microphone setup. Um, that's why we didn't have a show last week because the lab mic died on me. So while I've done some recording and figured out the mic and recording, this is the first live stream I've done with this mic setup. So let me know if we're too hot or not. It's uh, looking like the levels are good on my end, but definitely give me thumbs up, uh, thumbs down. First of all, you can hear me, but it's also not like too loud and spiking and, and clipping the, the audio on me, uh, which is why I'm, look at that. I'm one minute early for once. I'm one minute early. That's good. May or may not have broken a speed limit or two to get here in time. <laughs> Maybe. Good sound. All right. Excellent. Yeah. See, because my settings are totally different um, than they were on my previous setup. And I had figured out what worked well for live stream and what worked well for recording. And now it's all to do this last week. As I said, the technology let me down. I did a few tests using some of my podcast mic and the sounds just not good. There's just too much echo and I just didn't want to throw that out there. So we're back. I do want to say since this is down on the bottom here, thank you so much to uh, Patreon supporters because it was really easy to pull the trigger on a brand new, um, very expensive lavalier system when I've got some support from you guys. So thank you so much. That made the decision heck of a lot easier. I was able to turn on a dime and be able to get new tech in. Let's face it, my old lavalier mic was like six years old, which might as well be 60 years old when it comes to technology. So glad that I was able to uh, get the new one in and I think it sounds a lot better too. So anyway, today we are going to talk about, I've spent the last time talking about how flat is flat enough. Today I'm gonna talk about when flat, when I purposely make things out of flat, not flat, specifically starting with a spring joint. I've had multiple questions over the years about spring joints. I know I've demoed it in various projects, but I happen to need to make a panel for a project I'm working on. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut a spring joint. That is a perfect situation where I'm taking a flat surface and making it not flat. And I've got a question already in the chat room, which uh, um, uh, just says Fort Madison. All right, well, the entire town of Fort Madison, Iowa has written in to say, um, do you prefer hide glue or yellow glue when gluing spring joints? I use hide glue, but that's not like I use hide glue for spring joints and I use yellow glue for everything. I use hide glue for pretty much everything. Um, there are some times I have some tight bond too in the cabinet, that's my glue cabinet back there in the corner, that sometimes I'll pull it out um, for like shop projects and things and I just don't feel like heating up my glue pot or whatever. But almost 100% of the time I'm using hide glue. I just like hide glue better than any other glue when it comes to most, um, most furniture projects for a number of reasons. Um, when I, as I said, when I go to hide glue a lot of time or when I go to a yellow glue, a PVA glue, it's more just me being lazy. Um, technically with liquid hide glue, I don't have to heat it, but I like to heat it slightly because I find that it flows a little bit better. It has absolutely nothing to do with spring joints. And I know one of the reasons you might ask is hide glue is more gap filling than a typical yellow PVA glue. But the gap we're creating with a spring joint is not big enough that it matters. Moreover, there actually is not a gap with a spring joint. So thank you for asking that question because it segues nicely into the demo on spring joints. And um, thank you for putting that question in all caps. It makes it so much easier to see it. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Full of thanks all around here. Let's uh, kill that. Um, I need to saw a couple of boards, or one board rather, into a couple of parts. It's not really part of the demo, but rather than you guys just standing there listening to me saw, let's make it part of the show. This is the bore that I'm going to glue up into a panel. So quick little cross-cutting demo. Um, 
I put my, I'm left-handed, so I put my right knee, my non-sawing knee on the board to hold it in place, and I put my sawing knee right up against the back of the board. So any force of the board back towards me is held in place by this knee. Moreover, that moving this knee in allows me to square my body up in such a way to allow for easy motion of the saw and square sawing. Not that this cut has to be particularly square. Moreover, it's not like my crayon line is square. I didn't lay this lumber crayon line on using a square. I used my eye. <laughs> so it's not like I'm trying to meet this line. I mean, obviously, looking at this orange line, it's not even straight. But what I am doing is starting right here because I know that was where I lay in my measurement and just letting the saw cut straight for me. When your body is lined up and the saw is running as it should, it's going to saw square. It's going to saw straight rather. So if Somebody had asked a while ago about a shop tour been a while since I've done a shop tour. Um, quick just poll of the chat room. Does anybody care? <laughs> I haven't changed my shop appreciably in quite some time, so um, I'm perfectly willing to dedicate one of these sessions to a shop tour if that interests you guys, but at the same time, I don't want to necessarily repeat myself. So those of you in the chat room, what say you? Did you, uh, did you want to see something like that? Is a spring joint worth doing on a cutting board? No, I wouldn't think so. Um, unless your cutting board is like ginormously huge. Um, no. And that actually is a good question because it should uh, kind of bring up the point of why do we do a spring joint? What to do if your saw doesn't hold its sharpness? Uh, Probably get a new saw. Um, the spring steel of a saw should have a fair amount of, I'm just checking my board just to see out of curiosity and yeah, it's a square cut. Just so I'm not making things up. When you line up your body to be square, we end up with a square cut. But again, it doesn't really matter in this case. The ends of these boards are not even close to being used as a reference line. Um, this is just about the panel. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, the spring steel, the reason it's called spring steel is it, it's got a memory to it. You can bend it and when you let it go, it springs back to its shape. That has a certain amount of hardness to it to begin with. So, if you are using a saw and you find that it's getting dull really fast, first you want to check the sawtooth geometry. How is that saw set up? Is it set up like super, super aggressive? Um, are you sawing hardwoods and yet you've got a positive rake where the tooth is leaned forward? Those teeth are going to dull really quick. They might even break. Or are you, do you have a lot of fleam, an excessive amount of fleam on the teeth? So, you know, the typical rip saw has zero fleam. So if you're looking dead onto the teeth, you have a flat, face like a chisel coming right at you. The minute you add fleam, you're changing that angle so that you get kind of a knife edge out on the leading part of that angle. Well, the more fleam you add to that, the less steel there is behind that knife edge and the tooth becomes weaker. So you might have an excessive amount of fleam and the teeth are just dulling because you're, you're, you just don't have very much steel there. The next thing is, what does your set look like? If your set is really, really narrow and the saw is binding, there's going to be an excessive amount of heat building up, which is going to cause the teeth to dull. Next thing, what kind of wood are you working with? Are you working with nasty jungle wood that is already going to be super, super hard and could possibly dull your teeth quickly? The, I guess there's really no rule of thumb, but to give you an idea, I use my saws like every day on every single project but I'm hardly sharpening my, um, my full-size hand saws maybe once every couple of months, maybe every quarter. They just don't need to be sharpened that often. They hold their sharpness a long time. Now, I work with primarily domestic woods to North America. I work with kind of hand tool friendly woods. 
you know, I do use, when it comes to exotics, I do use a lot of teak because I happen to work for the largest importer of teak in the country. But teak is actually, despite what people tell you about it being high silica and eat your blades, total myth. It's not a myth, but no, it's just don't pay attention to that. So for the most part, the woods that I'm working are relatively friendly, but even then I go a long, long time before I have to sharpen again. So if your saw is not holding its sharpness, there's probably something wrong with the geometry, making the tooth just innately weaker. Maybe the gullets are super deep. Maybe it's sharpened like the pitch is kind of odd and you've got um, fragile kind of narrow teeth. There's too steep of an angle on the back side of the tooth. So somebody tried to sharpen it like a Japanese saw with a long tooth, totally different type of steel. Or that could just be bad steel. Um, you don't know what that saw has been through. If it's a vintage saw, who knows? You know, sometimes when people find a kink in the saw and they try to hammer it out, you can actually ruin a saw plate and end up with a weak spot in it. Or what you also may find is it's not the whole saw is weak. And fourth, eventually it's gonna snap. And if you do this in trying to remove kink from a saw plate, you are weakening the steel. And rather than it necessarily being dull and not cutting, the saw plate itself could be flexing and causing all kinds of binding issues and things like that. I'm not gonna say that spring steel doesn't actually go dull. Of course it goes dull, but it's not like you can really draw temper out of spring steel like you do with burning a plane blade or a chisel blade. In the end, it's probably an issue where there's something was abused with that particular steel and it may be time to look for a better saw or another saw at least. Um, the question about what I use spring joints on a cutting board. I want to talk a little bit about why we're doing a spring joint in the first place. And actually, if you listen to the most recent episode of Wood Talk, I did describe this, um, why we're using a spring joint. So if you don't know, and we're going to do this in just a second. But a spring joint, obviously you've got a panel joint and it's a nice straight edge. With a spring joint, I purposely remove a bit of material in the end. So I'm creating a slight hollow in the middle of this board. So then I come in with a clamp and I squeeze across this hollow and I put the board into compression so that I close up this hollow that I'm creating. And so as I said earlier, you might think a gap filling glue like high glue can be good on a spring joint, but once I put this under compression, there is no gap anymore. So any glue is gonna work fine here. By putting this in compression, actually I shouldn't say that, by putting this under tension, closing up that gap, I'm putting the two opposite ends into compression. This has to come together and has to essentially bend out the slight hollow we have in the middle and it's forcing these fibers into compression, squeezing them back in order to close that gap. The reason for this, A, you can run a single clamp across it and clamp up a panel with one clamp. That's kind of a byproduct. That's kind of a neat thing to say. You can glue up a bunch of panels just using one clamp per panel. whoopity do. The real reason for this, on a larger panel, at the ends is going to the weakest part of this joint. The ingrain is where we're exchanging the moisture most readily. There are a bunch of straws in the fibers here and those straws are exposed to the atmosphere. They're dumping moisture and picking up moisture with every change in the ambient humidity around you. So in other words, the ends of the boards are expanding and contracting more than the center of the panel because these fibers aren't dumping moisture as fast. They're relatively stable in most you know, climate controlled environments. These can expand and contract with, you know, afternoon sun falling on a table for an hour. Even though it's in a climate controlled environment, the heating that you can get from afternoon sun for an hour will cause these to shrink. It's going to dry out those boards. Vice versa, then they're going to swell when that afternoon sun goes away and moves off the end of that board. So you're seeing a differential in the expansion and contraction from the ends of the board to the middle of the board. And what that causes to happen over time is these joints open up on the ends. So by putting them into compression, you're adding a little bit of extra oomph, a little bit of extra stick togetherness right at the ends. And it's forcing them to be able to combat that additional dynamic force of additional expansion and contraction. The same thing can be looked at in a slightly different way. Choosing to put a joint into compression means that it will withstand dynamic forces. You ever heard of a drawboard joint? Where we drive a peg through an offset hole and it 
pull or draws the tendon shoulder up against the mortise. You're putting that under compression. So if I have a board and I stand with this board just kind of holding it, not, not compressing it together, just holding it, and you come up and you try to grab it in the middle and pull it away from me, you'll be able to pull it away relatively easily. But if I put it under compression and really press it together, and now you try to pull that board out, you may still be able to, you may just be stronger than me, most likely, but you're gonna have more difficult times. It's gonna require more force to pull this board out of my hands because I'm putting it under compression. So the dynamic force, the pulling of that board away is resistant based and the ingrain walls of the female part of that half lap are compressing on the softer, more compressible long grain fibers of the male part of the joint. Puts that joint in compression so when your typical earthquake rolls through the islands of Japan, shakes the whole thing around, it doesn't shake it apart because that joint has that little bit of extra stickiness under compression. We do the same thing with chairs, relying upon, ooh, look at the dust, um, relying upon the green fibers and the moisture differential in the parts of our chair, when you bore this hole, that hole immediately starts shrinking because this wood is green. It's dumping moisture really fast. If I take my tenon and I ultra dry it, I like stick it under heat and suck all the moisture out, that tenon shrinks up. I stick it into a wet, relatively wet board mortise hole, the moisture transfers from the hole into the tenon. The tenon swells up while the hole shrinks and it puts the tenon in compression. So now the ultimate dynamic force is the chair. As I sit on this and every time I shift around or I lean back or whatever, there's dynamic forces on that mortise and tenon and that compression holds the joint together for hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's the story of the spring joint. We're intentionally introducing compression in order to keep that joint together. So back to the cutting board question, what kind of dynamic forces are we really running into with the cutting board? How big are we making that cutting board? And you've got a whole bunch of different joints and things in there together. It's just not really something I think you're gonna run into a lot of issue for that. Moreover, the, if it's an ingrain cutting board, you know, it's different grain orientation, right? You're, you're losing grain or losing moisture out the top, but you're also kind of uniformly losing moisture and gaining moisture because you've got ingrain exposed across the entire board. So there's really no reason to do that. If you're making a long grain cutting board, I suppose, you know, if it's, if it's about this big, I mean, I'm gonna use a spring joint on the panel about this big. If it's long grain, I suppose you could make a case for putting a spring joint in there. The fact of the matter is, if you put a wooden, wooden cutting board into a dishwasher, you're gonna have problems anyway. So yeah, I suppose it's something, but it would need to specifically be a long grain cutting board. If you are making like long grain bunch of strips, I think that would be too much compression. If you're compressing every single, say you've got two inch wide strips and maybe you've got six or seven or eight of them across the width of a cutting board, I don't know that that's really necessary. You're better to shoot for a good flat panel joint and glue the whole thing up because at that point you've got a heck of a lot of glue in there. Moreover, you know, the cutting board is, is going to be relatively thin. I don't know, maybe it's not. I just, I don't know whether that just might be overkill because there's really not a lot of forces being involved there. So um, to do this, we've talked about match planing before. Um, so all of my panel joints start with match plane. Yes, for all you crisscross users, you can laugh at me because I have to adjust the peg on my leg vise. So very ghetto. There are a bunch of questions in the chat room. I will get to them in just a second. Um, I want to make sure that I've got the grain the way I want it on this. Certainly, I like to try to get the grain so that it's all running the same direction. But in the end, I really want more, more about a pleasing look than anything else. No, I liked it the way I had it. Yep, I'm gonna go with this. In fact, I've already marked it that way, so I'm gonna stick with it that way. So this I will put together in a little book match. 
clamp that up. Um, uh, if you need a link for last week's show, well, there was no show last week, but uh, just go to this channel. You'll find it. It's how flat is flat enough. Um, which words work best with hand tools? Short words. Uh, which woods work best for hand tools? Jeff, I think that's probably a whole session in and of itself. Um, but if you haven't listened to the Lumber Update podcast, I talk a lot about understanding technical specifications. And if you look on my channel and you look for the uh, class that I taught at Woodworking in America in 2016, uh, it's entitled Wood, What Is It Good For? There is a two hour class there that talks about using technical properties of wood to determine how it works and what it works best for. Um, it's actually a synopsis of a lesson that I have in the hand tool school called the World Wood Tour that talks about which woods work best for hand tools and importantly, what specific technical specs work good for hand tools. Maybe something worth visiting in a future, um, a future whatchamacallit uh, episode. If the sound is out of sync, it's probably on your end. Okay. What's an inexpensive hardwood to learn on? Poplar. At least in North America, poplar. Okay, let's get, let's get uh, cooking here. I thought I saw something about a camber. Uh, when should a plain iron be cambered and how much? Woo, that's a deep question, sir. Um, a plain iron should be cambered based on how you want to use it. How much is how much you want to use it. Um, I say camber all your smoothing planes um, and camber your four plane or your scrub plane iron. The rest of them I don't camber. I will maybe slightly clip off the corners of my other planes, but for the most part, I don't camber them. My four plane, I do a nine inch radius. My scrub plane, I do a three inch radius. My smoothing plane, I do a <laughs> radius. I do, I don't know. I relieve the corners by maybe a thousand of an inch. It's not a measurable radius. Um, I think I answered the question about what is a spring joint, hopefully. Um, so I've got my four plane here, mainly because I've got a lot of wood to remove. There's a little bit of figure in these boards. So I've got some kind of undulation in the curves or the, some, the undulation in the curl is causing like little dips in the, the heiress of these boards. So I have to remove a fair amount of material. Here is a perfect example of a plane that I want cambered. I've got a big nine inch radius on this plane and it allows me to take heavy scooping cuts and remove a lot of wood fast. And I can't remember whoever was asking for the link. It's a little difficult for me to find a link while I'm in the middle of a live stream, but if someone in the chat room wants to point him to uh, last week's episode, or if we're talking about Wood Talks last week episode, go to woodtalkshow.com. It's right there on the front page. You can go even deeper. Why not? Okay. Almost there. If you want to see a little closer what I'm talking about here, the curl in this board is giving me, you know, you see like there's almost a little divot in the side of the board where the curl has come in and it's, it's, created a divot in the heiress itself. And I can see like divots on the inside of the joint. <laughs> 
Okay. I think that is enough. Now I'm going to switch to my jointer plane. I could switch to my jack plane here. Frankly, this board's not long enough, but I happen to have the jointer nearby. My jointer plane does not have a camber. The angle I create is a complementary angle that will result in a flat board. Now, is my jointer plane wide enough? It is just barely wide enough. So let's just take a full pass and see. Whoa, let's take a much deeper cut than that. I want to see how flat or out of flat this kind of undulating edge is. Open up the mouth of my joiner a little bit here. It's the nice thing about this Veritas plane is the mouth is adjustable and I had this set up for taking a really fine cut for some reason. Okay, that's planing relatively uniformly. There is some tear out on the surface from the curl. You can see the tear out there and the tear out there. Um, so it's making a little hard to see how flat I am. So if you go back a couple of episodes here, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I did a whole thing about match planing 2.0 where I used these hash marks. So this is a little bit of a revisiting of that. Yeah, exactly. Now I'm taking too heavy of a cut. There we go. Let's back that cut off. So here's the first thing about a panel joint like this. You get it to the point where you're taking that, that full length cut and then you back the blade off. And what I'm doing by backing the blade off is essentially tightening the tolerance, making the board flatter, in other words. It's just kind of a nice little, call it, a last step, if you will, before you would join the panel together, which is the other point. If I'm going to do a spring joint, I definitely don't want the plane set heavily. Okay, that is jointed and ready to go into a panel. And in case anybody's not following the whole match planing idea, this is not square to the face. It is at a slight angle leaning down this direction. I don't care because my boards unfold into a complementary angle. The key is just getting a flat surface here. So now what I want to do is take that out of flat. So I will come in and look, here's the center of the joint and just kind of by eye, break it up into thirds or quarters rather. Um, and what I want to do, mark those quarters and then I will have that. So essentially I'm dividing into eights, but I'm going to come in here and in this center quarter here, is where I want to focus the spring joint. Because my plane is taking a lighter shaving, it's pretty typical for a jointer plane. It's taking probably, a, I don't know, four to five thousandths of an inch thick shaving at this point. So when I take a pass here, I'm not really taking off that much material. But just in case, I'm gonna go ahead and back my cutoff maybe a quarter rotation on the adjuster. And I wanna take a pass from this line to this line, that internal quarter of this joint. If I can even do that. I may not be able to do that. The board may be, I may be taking too light of a cut here. And that's the next thing you have to determine if I do that. See, I'm taking a little bit of a material there, but I'm gonna go ahead and put that quarter turn back onto the plane. And now I've removed the line. I've still got my line there, but you can see the cut starts right behind it. So I've essentially created whatever that depth of cut is, a hollow right in the middle. 
Now, these lines back here, these were the initial quarter divisions. Now I'm gonna take a pass from this line to this line. Two times a plane is run over the center section. So ideally, I've got kind of a curve where the deepest part is in the internal eighth there. And that really can be it. So just for giggles, for due measure, I'm gonna back the plane off, maybe another quarter turn, and I'm gonna come back and take a full length pass. And I think that should do it. So let's clear off workspace a little bit here. And zoom out a bit. Excellent. So now, can I even pick this up? The panel has, it's coming together nicely. And if I look real close, I've got a tight joint here and here, and there's just a hairline, you know, black line, a black gap right in the middle. And you can see that gap gets narrower and narrower and narrower. So the gap is the widest in that internal quarter of the board. And it starts to narrow down until it disappears beyond that. That is, that's a spring joint. And that's all I gotta do. The real test of this is grab a clamp, throw it across it, and you wanna be able to close up that gap under clamping pressure. And you know, certainly these parallel clamps can exert like 3,800 pounds per square inch, but I'm hardly cranking down on this. Just hand pressure tight and that gap, that little black line now disappears. I've pulled it in tight, compressing the two ends, putting that extra pressure on that spring joint or creating that spring joint, springing it together. And essentially, yeah, I could go ahead and call this board done with just this single clamp. There's no reason to add more. Honestly, I usually end up doing it anyway. Um, I usually go back and um, normally how I would glue up a panel like this, is I wouldn't glue it sideways, first of all. But that's the nice thing about these parallel clamps is you, you've got more clamping pressure if you do it sideways. This board's a little too thick for that. Most generally what I'm gonna do is have probably well, see, this board's narrow enough. I would say I could put three clamps on this, but that's a lot of clamps for just this narrow thing. So I don't know, maybe I would get away with one clamp um, because you really do want to have clamping pressure across the center of this joint, the part where the gap is the widest. Otherwise, you're kind of defeating the purpose. You know, you're not going to be able to, to close that gap up quite as easily um, by applying clamping pressure around it. The other thing is like if the way I'm holding this board right now, I'm actually holding it level or, or flush with my fingers on this end. You gotta be careful when you clamp this up, you can actually pinch your fingers because that joint will come together really tight. So it only happens once before you realize, oops, you don't do that again. But normally I would use the parallel clamp in this orientation because I get a little bit more clamping pressure. And if nothing else, I can apply a clamp here and a clamp there because um, I've got the clamps to do it. If I were really short on clamps and had a bunch of panels to glue up, this is nice if you should do it with one single clamp, but I don't ever actually glue up that many panels at once. If I had that many panels to glue up at once, I glue them, you know, slowly um, over time. Because really, you put glue on this, high glue, PVA glue or whatever, put it in clamping pressure, and like 20 to 30 minutes later, it can come out of the clamps. So if you completely run out of clamps because you glued up two panels, well then, and you know, say you have five more panels to do, go back to what I just did, the spring joint and all that stuff. By the time I'm done planing the board and getting ready to go, I'm probably very close to being able to pull the clamps off one of those panels. Now you don't wanna stress that panel until it's fully cured. You wanna give it 24 hours to cure, but the clamping time of most PVA glues is like 20 to 30 minutes. High glue is about the same. So it's important to recognize there's a difference there. Clamping time and curing time are two very different things. Not 
Not really in function, but in execution, it does. So you noticed, I find generally, if I'm using, just in, in general, I don't like to use a plane that is as long as the board that I'm working on. So in this instance, right away, you can see the joiner plane is not something that I would normally use for this because it's already as long as the panel I'm working on. So in execution, as you noticed, I actually, I, that first pass I made in the middle, I lightened up my cut and I didn't quite get a good first pass there. So I had to, to deepen the cut back to its original point in order to just take that little hollow out of the middle. Because the longer the plane, the flatter the surface, the more it's going to ride over the little hills and valleys. So it can be difficult in execution to actually create that little hollow. But even then you saw with, well, I swept all my shavings off, but the shavings, I wasn't taking a heavy cut there. I was taking, I would say a medium light cut and using a 22 inch joiner plane, I was still able to create that hollow, those two passes on a board that's about the same length. If I step down to something like a jack plane is what I would normally use for a board like this, you can make that hollow a little bit easier. So in theory, it's a, in function, it's still the same. You're still taking that center pass and then that second pass to take out, um, to kind of round the curve a little bit more. But in execution, you have to be careful that you are in fact backing off the depth of cut because now this shorter sole plane can ride into a valley a little bit more. I can create more of a hollow. So really, I don't find that I have to change the depth of cut all that much. Every time I make a panel joint, I get it flat, then I back off the cut, maybe half a turn, quarter a turn, and I joint it again. I'm, I'm again tightening that tolerance, like I said. And then usually without touching the adjuster, I can go right into making that, those two spring joint passes. You may run into problems as you get into longer and longer boards where it can be a little difficult because the longer the board, right? If we're dividing the board into quadrants, well, you know, the, the quadrant on this 20 inch long board is this wide, but the quadrant on an eight foot long board is quite a bit longer. So now you're having to take a longer hollow, but even then, in theory, I keep saying in theory, in function, it's still pretty much the same. Just be cognizant of the fact that if you deepen the cut in order to create that scooping motion, and you come back here, this is why you test it, right? You come back, you may see that hollow, but if you can't close that little black gap with just simple hand pressure, and, and really, parallel clamps make things a lot easier because they exert so much clamping force. But if you really want to test, have I done this right? Just use a typical F clamp that is going to exert much less force and try to close up that, that gap. And I can close that gap using just a plain old F clamp. And again, you didn't see me grunting to tighten that up. It's not really about that. So this is good. If I couldn't close that up without extensive pressure on the clamp, I removed too much. And you need to put it back in the vise and essentially erase what you did by taking you know, one or two full length passes. That will usually be enough to erase that. Then lighten up your cut. Again, about a quarter turn back. As long as everybody recognizes when you back a blade off in a plane, you do have to advance the adjuster a little bit because you pulled it back and there's a little slack in the mechanism. And you'll feel it when I pull this back it, I feel the tension as it adjusts. And then as I rotate it forward, it's pretty much freewheeling. And you'll feel that tension kind of ratchet up as it goes from freewheeling to engaging. And you just turn it just to engage it so that the blade doesn't slip back because there's that little bit of play in the motion. So you back that off about a quarter turn, advance it to bring up the slack and then do it again. Um, so, you know, you, you may need to make a couple of spring joint attempts to kind of get the feel for how much to take off. But in the end, you're not taking off a lot of material here. Like at most, there's two to three thousandths of an inch gap times two, because again, we've just done it to both boards at the same time. So I may have like a six or seven thousandths of an inch gap in the middle here. I may not, I've never measured this. I've never pulled out feeler gauges. I suppose if I really wanted to, I don't own feeler gauges, but I could put a feeler gauge in there and see, you know, you can't close a gap of wider than X feeler gauges, but again, that's gonna vary depending upon the species, it's gonna vary upon the length of the joint. There's so many factors that come into that. So in the end, the only way to know if you've done it right 
pull out a clamp. Can you close that gap? If you can't, start over, do it again, but with less of a depth of cut for those um, internal two passes. Then you know you've done it right. And you will start to get a feel for, you know, the different planes that I'm using, the different lengths of the planes and things. Again, it should be the same. And if you find that because I'm using a long plane, I'm really struggling with this, it might just be an excuse to step down to a smaller plane. If you don't have a smaller plane, it's an excuse to get a smaller plane. Everybody loves an opportunity to, to, to acquire new tools, right? Uh, jack without a cambered blade? Yes, my jack does not have a cambered blade. As I said before, the only planes I use that have a camber are my four plane, my scrub plane, my other planes, well, my smoothing plane, but again, the camber on the smoothing plane is so slight it doesn't look curved. All my other planes are straight blades. I don't care. I will slightly clip the corners. I doubt I'll be able to get this to come out, but if I look at this plane, it's almost as if there's a little chamfer on the edge, like, I don't know, a 64th of an inch chamfer right on the edge. I've just clipped off those corners. And the only thing that does is it just kind of lessens the plane tracks that you might see. You know, if your corners are square, you're gonna get a little notch, a plane track that shows up. If the corners are clipped, instead of it being a hard right angle notch, it's got a slight slope to it, and it just ends up being a little, little less noticeable. I don't mind plane tracks, honestly. Most of my non-show surfaces, I leave the plane tracks on them. I kind of think it looks cool. Um, to me, having a camber on all your blades just makes things more difficult to sharpen, and it's just not necessary. The reason we camber a blade on a smoothing plane is to remove plane tracks. The, that's the only reason you, you do it on a smoothing plane. You don't remove, put a camber on a four plane to deal with plane tracks. You put a camber on a four plane because the scooping action allows you to take a heavier cut with less tear out because you don't have those corners. So only the smoothing plane do we carry a care about plane tracks unless, you know, unless you're using a jack as a smoother, as a finish prep, in which case I think you're working too hard because this is too long. The only other time we put the camber on there is to, to ease the passage of the blade through the wood because you're taking a heavy cut which is why none of my medium work planes like the jack or the joiner have a camber on them. No need, it's just, it's not necessary. Yeah, get a smaller plane. That's, uh, that's, that's what everybody's looking for, right? You know the podcast I mentioned? You mean Wood Talk, Jeff? Woodtalkshow.com. Wow, that's, that's actually really exciting. You know, Wood Talk's been around for 10 years. You tend to think the whole woodworking community knows all about Wood Talk. Um, and it's, it's been really exciting to find out that there is a lot of people out there who've never heard of the show. There's a lot of people that we have yet to touch with our stupidness. So yes, woodtalkshow.com. Great, great, uh, great podcast because it's got three hosts with very different viewpoints on woodworking very different viewpoints on woodworking. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is other instances where we want to make a board out of flat. This is probably enough of a mark for me, but I'm going to mark it the way I want it anyway, because I'm not going to glue this up right now. I'm going to glue this up tonight. Similar to the spring joint, well, actually, no. If you have, you know, spring joint, we're pulling these two boards together on edge, but there's gonna be times when you need to put boards together on their faces. Look, for example, at my workbench. My workbench is a bunch of four and a half inch wide boards that have been turned on edge and glued face to face in order to make my bench top. So when you have, especially in the instance of a workbench, where you've got, you know, this huge face, this is a nine foot long bench, nine-ish, I haven't measured it recently, I, I don't remember. Um, it's a long board and it's an almost five inch wide face. That's a huge face to put together. So rather than making your work 
so much harder for you. If this were the boards I was laminating together on this face, and this actually goes together pretty well, but a lot of times, especially when it's a really long board, you may find little gaps. So for example, if I squeeze together on this end, I've got a slight gap opening up down on this end. In other words, there's a little bit of bow in either this teak board or this pine board. I can't quite tell. Um, I could flip this over and I might get a little bit better reference, but again, something is still a little out of flat here and it's causing those gaps to open. Or over on the other side, I've got, if I squeeze this edge together on the other side, I've got a little bit of a gap here. So one of the things I can do is actually remove some material right in the middle. Get you a better angle here. And actually, um, way back with uh, Christopher Shores, his original workbench book, I'm gonna exaggerate this a little bit, but Chris's original workbench book talks about using a block plane for this. Um, and all your bench laminations just come in and run a block plane right down the middle. I'm gonna use my scrub plane for effect because it's gonna kind of exaggerate what we're talking about here. So if I come up to this board and take, <laughs> that's too much. <laughs> I'm gonna remove an eighth of an inch from the center of the board. That's better. If I take a, a scrub pass right down the middle of the board, I've created a cove, I've created a hollow right in the middle and I can actually feel that. It's substantial enough. This is probably a 16th of an inch shaving that I just pulled out of the middle. Now I'll do the same thing on this teak board. God, look at how beautifully that teak works. Again, anybody who tells you that teak is, is not a hand tool friendly wood or it's gonna eat your blades is just full of it. So now these two boards, and I mean, you feel it immediately. I mean, the sound that makes is really solid. But before, here, let's flip to these edges. Before, when I was putting these together and you rub them back and forth, they feel pretty good, but you can see that there's, there's a little bit of rock. If I pull these boards together, they clearly click together. And as I try to rub them back and forth, I'm actually not moving them. You know, little, little bit of pressure is all it takes to move these back and forth. These, that same amount of pressure and these boards are not moving. And if I look on the end grain there, there's ever so slightly a little bit of a gap. I mean, even with my scrub plane, you know, that's a, that's a pretty heavy amount of material that I removed there. There's still not that big of a gap when you put it kind of in context, but these come together. Now this edge is super tight on this face and super tight on this face. And this edge, this is what we're looking at here. And this bench, when it was laminated together, now because these are like not even two inches wide, these were much wider, I would come in with, I actually used um, a jack plane in that instance, and I just ran a plane pass right down the middle of every board, creating that slight hollow, clearing the meat out of the way. So I've purposely taken this board and taken it out of flat. So when I hold a square across this, I've got a definite hollow in that board. I purposely made it not flat so as to bring the edges together that counts. Now, have I weakened the glue joint? Well, if you took a heavy enough pass out of there, I suppose. But even then, this cove, let's see if I can do this. This cove, really runs kind of right in there. So as I look at this, I've got flat wood here and here, here and here. I've probably got half an inch and another half an inch. So I've got glue surface that runs all the way down both edges. That's a half inch wide. That's a full inch of glue surface. And it's not like this cove that I've cut out is so dramatically deep that I'm probably not going to have a glue surface there as well, especially once you put the faces together and you start clamping them up. Now, the fact of the matter is with two boards like this, this narrow, I probably wouldn't use this technique because there's just so little surface already. But when you start talking about boards that are gonna be four and a half, five inches, six inches wide, you can run that same pass, this cove, 
with that current setting, it's maybe a 16th of an inch deep and it is probably, it's almost 5 eighths of an inch wide. So I've put a hollow down the middle of that board that's 5 and 8, 5 8 inches wide. What if this board was actually 4 inches wide? Well, now I've got substantial amount of glue surface on this board, and that little hollow is not going to weaken anything whatsoever. Because you're gluing two faces together, you've got a huge amount of glue surface anyway, so you can stack the cards in your favor by putting that little hollow in there. Wait, what was that? Reverse spring equals panel call. Yes. So if you put a bow in a board, so if I took this board and I removed a little material down here, a little material down here, so that I've got kind of this curve. You know what? I have one. My straight edge, flat on one edge, and it is bowed on the other. I've got a definite curve here. So I can set this bow clamp on my straight edge and it's certainly rocking. But if I put clamping pressure here, oh, sorry, I'm zoomed in too tight. If I put clamping pressure on the extents of this, here and here, whoa, <laughs> on the two edges, and I clamp down, I'm putting a huge amount of force right smack in the middle of this board. So in the instance of a panel joint, say you wanted to make sure that you had good clamping pressure right in the middle on this joint, like you wanted to hold it flush there. You could run this bow clamp, this reverse spring joint, and get clamp at the sides and get strong pressure right in the middle. Or you could run it like that and get strong pressure right in the middle. Or say you had a joint that the, you, know, you were clamping down and you couldn't reach with the full clamp, you can use the call, the bow call like this to increase pressure right smack in the middle. That's not a spring joint. You definitely don't want to do that. Spring joining more than two boards. Okay, um, that starts to get hairy. You can do it. You absolutely can do it. Um, the question that you have to ask yourself is why? Um, what, what is it, again, what is the, the, the context? Um, if you are in a longer board, like a tabletop, it's gonna be very common that you're gonna have three, four, five boards across the tabletop. What I would do is spring joint, well, I mean, the narrower the boards are, the more flex they're gonna have, the more side bend flexion that they're gonna allow for. So it's not really gonna hurt anything to spring joint every single board, but in that instance, I would not try to do it all as one glue up. I would do it as sub assemblies. So say you had, you know, an, an odd number is nice and easy. If you had five boards, I would glue together the outer two, these two over here and these two over here as its own glue up. And I would spring those together and then I would glue one more glue up, taking the, the fifth board right in the middle and the two sub assemblies you've already done. And see, even then, if you're springing on two sides, you have to be cautious. This goes back to the idea of test it. Can you close it with a clamp? Because if not, if you're springing that middle board in the center, if you're springing both sides of it, you could have a tendency to have too much compression in there and you might have to lessen the amount of spring that you put into it. I don't think it's gonna hurt. It's not like you're gonna introduce too much, so much tension to the board that it does something wonky. Again, as long as you can close it with a medium amount of clamping pressure. Um, but in the instance of a, of a large tabletop like that, you are still gonna see a lot of expansion and contraction across those joints. The other thing you can do, frankly, if you're really concerned about that, put a breadboard on it. <laughs> Throw a breadboard and at the end of that, it's gonna solve all your problems. It's gonna hold the thing flat and it's also gonna help prevent some of that um, expansion and contraction that you're gonna see. While there's still ingrain there, you've got a glue joint butted up against it, which will, will help a lot of that. No reason to be embarrassed about things to learn. That's the beautiful thing about woodworking. There's so many things to learn that you never stop learning. Um, the last area that I wanna talk about is a joinery issue. Um, tell me I have a mortise and tenon joint. This'll work. <clears throat> 
I've got a lot of practice joints hanging on my wall over here. This is a bridle joint, but it'll work. The last instance where I'm purposely making something out of flat is a tenon cheek. And let's go to the closer shot here. In the instance of a tenon cheek, I make this shoulder is what is visible, right? This is the money shot. This is what we want to be nice and tight. Well, a lot of times people will have trouble getting that tight and you know they're coming in here and they're checking it with a square and they're seeing that this line is square across but it's still not closing properly because the shoulder itself is not square in this direction. And a lot of times it ends up being slump, slanted down so that no matter how much pressure you apply on this, you're not getting that joint to close because there's some meat in the inside right up against the tenon cheek that's preventing that to close. So rather than trying to get that flat, I will come in with a chisel and purposely undercut that. In many instances, I can actually do kind of a miniature spring where I'm undercutting it a little bit more right in the center. So when I clamp it up, I'm ensuring that the edges come up super tight as well. And I'm putting a little bit of tension, very little bit of tension in this joint because again, it's the, the tenon or the bridle in this case that's doing all the holding pressure. This ingrained surface on this purple heart is not really a glue joint. It's not really a glue surface because it's all ingrained, right? So undercutting, it just gets it out of the way. We're purposely doing that to allow our joints to close up more. In fact, in a lot of tenons, you'll find that this shoulder and this shoulder are actually set offset. So the back shoulder, if this is, you know, obviously this was, well, this is a test joint, but if this were a square, you know, both faces are visible. But if this were like a frame and panel assembly, this inside face is going to be invisible. So I may cut this shoulder back further so that I've got, you know, an eighth of an inch gap on this face and I'm flush on the front face. So you end up with this stagger effect. That's done on purpose to ensure that we get a nice tight closure on the show face itself. We're purposely cutting it, it's not really out of flat, but we're perfectly offsetting it. So the line across here is not flat, it's staggered. And this comes up a lot in joinery. Dovetails do this all the time. Um, that's why half blind dovetails are the easiest dovetail to cut because most of that tail is unseen. Most of that pin is unseen. So you can undercut like crazy in there. Well, I say undercut like crazy, recognize this is all in, in within reason. If you start, um, compromising the glue surface, that's an issue. In the instance of a tenon, the glue surface that we're undercutting is not really a glue surface because it's all ingrain. On a half blind dovetail, most of the strength comes from the mechanical interlock you get of the dovetail. You can undercut the walls on a lot of areas and still like this face joint, you still have glue surface on the either side of the part that you've undercut, but that undercut allows things to come together a little bit easier. It may ease the passage of a joint. You've got a wide cabinet side where you know you may have 15 dovetails across the cabinet. That can put a lot of stress as you're trying to assemble it. So undercutting it slightly in areas will allow it to fit together a little bit smoother and it comes tight kind of right at the last you know eighth of an inch as you seat the whole thing home just by undercutting it. Same idea behind a tapered sliding dovetail. It's a loose fit, loose fit, loose fit, and then it comes up tight in that last quarter of an inch and everything snugs together nicely. So we're purposely making it out of flat in order to ensure that things come together cleanly. So that's what I wanted to cover today. Did I miss any questions? What have I missed here? <laughs> Mirko says, uh, so many tricks to learn, I'm embarrassed because I'm a full-blown carpenter and absolutely nobody ever talked about this stuff. Well, see, there's a difference. You know, there's a difference between a joiner and a carpenter and a cabinet maker, you know, and, and a sawyer. Um, we all have different tolerances that we work to, but we all can learn from one another. Some of the most important hand tool skills that I have learned have come from 18th century carpenters or one could say an 18th century joiner. You will find there's a slight difference between those two titles. Cabinet makers and making furniture, they can kind of be fussy about a lot of different things and they work with some finer joints and things. We know the Cabinet Makers Guild was the only one that could cut dovetails back in the day. If a joiner cut a dovetail, he, was, he got in trouble. He was breaking the law. So they used mortise and tenons all the time. But 
the one thing that the joiner and the carpenter do that a cabinet maker does not is work out in the field. They have, you know, as a cabinet maker, I've got all my tools in this fancy cabinet. I've got this fancy workbench to work with. I've got, you know, a roof over my head. It's wonderful. You know, as a joiner, I may be out in a field somewhere putting up crown molding on a house or building a steeple. And all of my tools are right here. I got to carry them with me to the job site. And I don't really have a workbench that I'm working on. So learn, I learned so many things from those guys and the techniques they use for layout, the techniques they use for cutting. How I cut compound dovetails and compound butt joints today was learned from a timber framing manual. Because if you look up compound butt joints now, all you get are these logarithmic angle charts on how to create the resultant angle on a compound miter saw. You know, how to dial that, that 40, you know, 7.3884 angle in there. I'm not gonna measure that by hand. So I looked to the guys that work in the field, the carpenters and the joiners, on how they did it, and that's what I go with. So, you know, there's a lot of forgiveness in a controlled shop environment like this that your typical carpenter never had to deal with. And those guys are the true, the, the, the true people to be emulated um, in, in the woodworking world, in the hand tool world anyway. So, all right, folks. Well, let I me mean, just one little check to make sure I didn't uh, miss anything. Yeah, the takeaway today, woodtalkshow.com. Go there. Subscribe to the podcast. If nothing else, you'll have lots to laugh at. All right. Well, then I, I'm going to call it a night, folks. I really, really appreciate everybody coming out. As I said, I sincerely appreciate the, the Patreon support that I've had that made it so easy to, to get a new uh, um, lavalier mic. And, and as always, um, this is out here, folks. There's this coupon out there. If you are interested in the Hand Tool School and you're a listener here, I give you 10% off if you use the coupon code RWWLIVE. So go to handtoolschool.net. If something there interests you, use the code and save some money. Otherwise, have a great day, everybody. We'll see you around.